So I recently did a video, part one of, on a two-part series. I may add other parts, but right now we just plan two. Diabetic level glucose spikes seen even in healthy adults. So yes, the information's coming out. I, I routinely in my practice will see patients come to me who will swear that they don't have any problems with diabetes or prediabetes. Their glucose metabolism is absolutely normal. They've been told, checked annually and told that for years. And then they find out, hmm, maybe not the case. Usually with just an OGTT, uh, sometimes we have to go uh, to a complete craft uh, insulin survey. Um, <clears throat> continuous glucose monitoring uh, just came out recently. It's been out for a while, but it's been uh, with the Abbott Freestyle Libre, it became um, not affordable, but fairly cheap and uh, gives people a lot of information regarding their glucose pattern, their glycemic pattern. Um, <clears throat> and sure enough, the, um, the, pattern is, uh, the patterns are surprising people. I had a patient just yesterday who said, you know, um, I don't have any problems. I've been checked every year. Came to me for some cognitive issues. And um, first, uh, the fasting glucose was 80, 80 something, mid 80s. The uh, one hour glucose was 130, 140, a little bit high. Two hours was 160. She went on to tell me that, look, I continued to monitor it with finger sticks and it went over the next two hours, hours three and four, it went up over 200. So again, that's not unusual. I see that, uh, especially with my older patients, a lot more than any of us would like. So this article is published in PLOS Biology. Uh, that stands for Public Library of Science. These, artic uh, these um, journals have been uh, available for about 15 years now. I did a, uh, a video recently on the quality and impact of certain journals, and some of these are pretty respectable, these uh, online journals. This is a small study, 57 patients, so it's not, gonna, it's not earth shaking, but I think, it, I think it is, because I think it's one of the first studies coming out uh, indicating what many of us in this field have known, and that is <clears throat> we are way under-diagnosing diabetes and prediabetes. Um, <clears throat> this, uh, I'll get into some details on this regarding age, uh, BMI, uh, very telling information. But before we do, brief introduction. My name is Ford Brewer, F-O-R-D, Brewer, B-R-E-W-E-R. -E um, I started off my career as an ER doc, became very frustrated with what I saw in terms of uh, preventable death, disease, disability, being brought into the ER by my patients. So um, I went on to get training and prevention at Johns Hopkins, uh, was successful there, ended up running the program, and have been supervising and teaching primary care docs to do prevention for the past 30 years. Yes, I'm old. Um, <clears throat> so this article in PLOS One was, uh, the research was done by Heather Hall, a... Um, a graduate student there, and Michael Snyder was the senior author. Michael is the um, head of the Department of Genetics. I actually took genetics there um, on their distance program for about a year and a half. Didn't quite complete my degree, unfortunately, but learned a lot. Um, that was just a few years ago. Um, <clears throat> Well, I had the picture of Michael Schneider here. I guess it's not important. Um, I will go on. What, what is important is what, what you see in terms of these uh, numbers and the study. Uh, with 2% of the folks, well, with 15% of these adults, they saw um, indication under CGM or continuous glucose monitoring that they did have prediabetes. With 2%, they saw indication that they had they met the criteria for full-blown diabetes. And these were people that came into the study saying, I'm normal, I've been checked, I'm okay. You know, norm there are about 30 million people, I think, in the U.S. with um, uh, diagnosed diabetes. That's 10%. Um, another 84 million uh, pre-diabetic. 
The CDC says, for example, um, that's underdiagnosed by what, a factor of four, maybe? Um, they also say of the people that need to be on metformin, one out of 13 actually is or. Um, <clears throat> so again, way underdiagnosed, and this is starting to make some clarity around what's going on here. They took three uh, sample daily um, values for, quote, normal folks. This one is showing significant variability. As you see, the uh, numbers, that glucose value is tripping up above 200 quite a lot. This is the moderate variability, and that's the low variability, um, or minimal variability. This moderate variability was tripping up over 150. So uh, they did what they call a, a spectral uh, or fractional of time uh, glycemic index analysis. What they did, these, um, these monitors will last 10 days, and then you can put another monitor on, and it lasts another 10 days. So, and there is significant variability. This patient, for example, may have shown a greatly decreased uh, variability two weeks before. So what they did was they took certain time periods and said, okay, what portion of the time are these patients, these people spending, these study subjects, spending in significant variability versus uh, minimal vari variability? So, <clears throat> as again... As you see, there's a lot more people with diabetes problems than we thought. Here's a, here's a schematic of how the study was done. They basically just took uh, adults, some diabetic, some uh, um, glycemic, um, pre-diabetic, and mostly uh, fitting the criteria for normal or healthy, did these patterns, did a, what they call that... Uh, spectral clustering analysis that I showed a minute ago in terms of classifying their days and the number of days they spent with significant variability. Putting those in three categories. Um, then they also did some interesting stuff. They uh, compared it cl to clinical features. Uh, that's where we got the 15 and the 2%. 15% uh, actually uh, uh, pre-diabetic and 2% actually diabetic when they thought they were normal. Um, <clears throat> and then they gave them some standardized foods. One of the, one of the meals, uh, cereal with raisins, raised everybody's blood sugar. So <clears throat> the other thing they found out, though, was that there was significant variability by individual and by t uh, day regarding uh, the glycemic impact of food. So it uh, underlines what we learned from Sue. Um, I'm blanking on her name. She wrote the book, um, Blood Glucose 101. Jenny Rule, not Sue. Jenny Rule, where she says, eat to the glucometer. So we're all individualized, and we do have variability with our, within our own uh, body week by week. Uh, we need to monitor our reaction to foods. Now, here's some more information that came from this study. This was the two-hour glucose value, and this was the amount of time people spent in severe variability. So you see there is some correlation. I actually tried to draw this out, and pardon my uh, ugly drawing. This would be a correlation, and the correlation uh, coefficient, by the way, was 0.55. Now, what does that mean? Well, if there is a, um, actually, I got that backwards. If you saw a correlation of close to negative one, as one item goes up, as uh, two-hour blood glucose goes up, time and variability would go down. In the other uh, category, you would see this, where they go fairly well with the line. Uh, with zero correlation, it would just be all over the waterfront in a big circle, the dots compared to the straight line. And here you have, it's clearly a correlation, but it's not a one-to-one a -one correlation by any stretch. That's also not, ve uh, not very surprising to those of us who do this for a living. Um, 
Some people will come in, I think they've got uh, metabolism problems. They don't. Others um, uh, do have issues and surprise me. Bottom line, um, with the two-hour uh, value on OGTT, we do get some significant numbers, but it's not perfect. I had a patient yesterday who, uh, again, came in and told me she, she's been checked every year, never had a problem. Um, on her OGTT, her um, fasting number was in the mid-80s. Her one hour was 130, 140. Her two hour was 160. She went on uh, over the next couple of hours and did finger sticks to measure it and uh, went up over 200. Again, another patient that said, I've been checked every year. I don't have a problem. Uh, one key item to be aware of here. <clears throat> There were a couple of things that really stood out in terms of predictors. And these are things that there's a lot of debate about. And I don't really know why there's so much debate uh, on this channel and with people that have an interest. And that is two major drivers of glucose metabolism problems, BMI and age. So <clears throat> this was the correlation. This, is, this would show this could have happened at random. The guys with very little variation showed... Uh, low areas of BMI and low areas on their, um, on their age. In other words, young, if you're young and or um, thin, you tend to not uh, have glucose metabolism problems. If you're old or heavy, you tend to be more likely to have glucose metabolism problems. How many times have I said that? I have some glucose metabolism problems. My BMI is in the low 20s. But I'm 60. Again, about half of us appear to start having um, pre-diabetic um, metabolism by the time we're age 60. Thank you again for your interest.